so hi everyone. Um, today I'm just going to be talking about um, what animation is and what it's like at Sheridan and the portfolio process. So, you know, what you're going to have to do to create like a successful portfolio and kind of the steps to do that um, as well, you know, as any questions that you might have. So feel free to just stop me anytime and ask them and there will be time at the end to ask questions as well. Okay. So a little bit about me, my name is Ruby and I'm currently first year going into second year at Sheridan. Um, I also did two years of illustration at OCAD as well. Um, I went to school with Catherine and um, yeah, I just really enjoy doing cartoons and I like drawing a lot. I love animating as well. So yeah, that's kind of a little background about me. Um, so what is animation? So essentially what it is, it's just a form of storytelling. Um, you know, it's mostly drawn or it's just not about live action. It's mostly just kind of an imaginative world. And so there's different types of animation. So there's traditional animation, which is like hand-drawn animation. Um, we don't really do that now as much. Like at school, it's mostly on computer, um, digitally. So that's not something you need to worry too much about, but just kind of an intro. Um, so essentially people just draw on paper. They draw each scene by hand, each frame by hand, which is super, super hard work. Um, so for 2D animation, it's kind of what you see an example on the screen here. Um, it's something I did for school. Um, and essentially it's just like a flat picture um, and you're just doing it um, kind of digitally. So that's why I kind of separated that because 2D, I kind of imagine it as more of a digital thing. Um, so there's 3D, which is in a lot of movies as well. So, you know, if you think like WALL-E, Cloudy and a Chance of Meatballs, a lot of Disney Pixar films now are all in 3D. Um, there are a lot of times where people do kind of combine the two. So I don't know if you've guys seen the movie Klaus on Netflix, um, that they do combine a bit of 2D and 3D to kind of um, create a more atmospheric uh, feeling in the movie. There's also stop motion, which is if you've guys seen the Nightmare Before Christmas or Coraline, that's kind of, I personally think it's one of the more tedious um, options because you literally have to not only just create the characters out of pure like material but you also have to move it like bit by bit and like make sure every the lighting's right and you take a picture every time you move it and I've heard stories where um, you know if somebody kind of the lighting's off or the light bulbs go off or like somebody moves the lamp then they have to reshoot everything because every every single shot has to make sense with each other yeah, so essentially it's just a really fun way of storytelling. So, you know, like there's a lot of options you can go into. It's not just like 2D, it's not just 3D. You can have a mix of everything. There's some movies that have both stop motion, 2D and 3D. So, you know, you can combine. There's like a lot of options as well out there. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the portfolio process. Um, now I know they usually come out with the requirements around October, uh, November last year when I applied it was like early October so it kind of depends and the year before that because I applied like twice three times and the second time it was like near like the beginning of November but essentially I think if you guys you know really um, wanting to you know just create that successful portfolio I would suggest that you already just start brainstorming now because um, you can already search up um, the portfolio requirements online um, so you can have sort of a basis of what you need to work on. Essentially, over the years, they haven't really changed it too much. I would say that the character portion is usually always the same. Life drawing is always the same. Hand drawings, they change it up a bit, but you, you know, you should still practice like drawing hands and different positions and stuff like that. So that'll help a lot when it actually comes time to submit. Um, what else is there? Usually the storyboard, the past two years they've used the same characters, but what I would suggest in terms of storyboard is maybe you could like watch a movie and you could pause it um, and you know study how the director has kind of decided to frame the shots, like what makes, um, and you know try to figure out what makes a successful you know shot frame that kind of 
tells a story uh, effectively. So yeah, essentially, just practice a lot because if you know like, um, yeah, they need a character, they need this type of rotation, then you can kind of practice with different types of character, different types of rotation. So that way when you actually have to make your final piece, it'll, you'll feel a lot more comfortable with that as well. And you can maybe reuse something that you've done before. And um, what I find helps a lot with the portfolio pieces is if you kind of have a story in your mind, for example, um, like what kind of background your character might have, what kind of personality they might have. And in terms of the perspective aspect, the line drawings and stuff like that helps a lot with, oh, like, you know, what am I, what kind of story am I trying to tell with this piece? Uh, how does it help? Like, how am I, what, what props or what, how should I set up the room to help tell this story? Another thing is to ask for help, like anybody around you, you know, ask your friends, your mom, your teachers and stuff like that. Um, see like, you know, with their opinion on your drawing, like, you know, you never know. Like, I know they may not always be like artistically inclined, but you could just ask like, oh, what's your opinion on this? Like, how do you feel about this character? How do you feel about this drawing? Does it look right to you and stuff like that? And another thing is to always redraw because like it don't think like you draw it once or twice and it's going to be good sometimes it is but i would say most 99 percent of the time like you're gonna have to go in and fix things and redraw it redraw it redraw it so don't be afraid to do that don't think that every piece is going to be perfect um i also feel like you're never going to feel like it's perfect until like you submit it and then you really don't have a choice that's been my experience um, so yeah, just keep redrawing it, fix what you need to fix until, you know, you feel comfortable enough that you're like, okay, I feel confident to submit this. And another thing is to make sure that your format is correct for what they require, because a lot of the times people, you know, they don't read the requirements properly. They're kind of like, oh yeah, you know, I'll figure it out later, but like, don't like make sure that the dimensions are right. Make sure that the format that you're submitting it is right, because it's going to be online. Um, I know before they used to do it, they used to have to bring it in person. They don't do that anymore. So you just submit it all online. So make sure you have the right format requirements because it's going to be such a hassle if you have to call them and ask them to fix this and that because there's thousands of applicants. So, you know, just to get that out of the way, make sure you don't have those problems. Just double, triple check it. And I would say that to also keep it simple in a way, because I think a lot of times people try to overcomplicate it and it becomes a little overwhelming. So I think essentially if you're able to show um, the, the markers that you understand what they want, they, you, like you can do structure, you can proportion your drawings and it makes sense, it looks cohesive, then that's good enough. You don't have to be like, oh, it's not complicated enough. Like that's not always the case. You can have simple and successful characters and drawings and stuff like that and make it look professional as well. Like make sure that the pictures you take of your drawings or the scans or whatever you have to do to get it look nice, make it look nice, make it look professional, uh, make it look easy to read because they go through like hundreds of portfolios. So um, if your portfolio just does not look well presentable, you know, like the pictures are blurry or like the lighting is off, then, you know, I think that's just a few marks that maybe you could have that you could get that would make it a little better. So make it look professional, you know, maybe get Photoshop or get a, you know, if you're able to scan it, just scan it and maybe edit the scanning, you know, like go on Photoshop. I'm not saying like actually edit the drawing, but you know, like the contrast, the values, the tones and stuff like that. So, you know, if you want this part to be a little darker because that's what it looks like in real life, then do that. If you want to get rid of some of like dirty spots in the drawings then you can do that as well, just to make it look nice and neat and clean. So I'm going to just jump into the first part of the, part of the portfolio. So this is the observational drawing portion. So it says that essentially they're looking into your gestural concerns. Uh, gestural, if you guys don't know what that means, gesture is essentially just capturing movement of the form, capturing weight, capturing movement, I think is one of the most important things in life drawing, because essentially if you don't have a good foundation of like gesture or movement in the first few seconds, because what happens is the more you develop the drawing, the more stiff it's going to get. It's just inevitable, it's gonna happen. So when you first start off your drawing, try to catch as much of the movement as much as possible. Um, you know, make sure that, you know, it feels like right, like 
it feels like the way that it looks. You know, sometimes what I find helps is, um, you know, if you take the pose yourself, for example, if the model is reaching up, like you reach up as well sometimes, you know, it might, might be kind of embarrassing, but it helps because you can kind of feel the pose. You could feel like which part of your body is more strained or which part of your body is feeling lighter or whatever it may be. And then you can kind of draw based on that. Um, so you don't have to shade. So that's not really required. I did, for me, I submitted a shaded drawing just because um, I just felt like it was one of the stronger pieces. You don't have to, but if you feel like that's something that you want to do, then you can also do that. Structure and form, importance. Structure is kind of essentially how you build up your drawing. So, you know, like, how does this arm look? It's not just two lines. Like, there's a shape, there's a form around it, right? So it's more of a cylinder. Like, not to actually draw a cylinder, but, like, sometimes you can draw it, like, the way you draw it, you can kind of um, imitate that a little bit or like the body is more of like kind of like a bean shape so you can kind of start it with that and they can kind of see like oh this is how the person thinks it's not just like drawing a flat image onto a, a flat image it's kind of like showing form showing volume showing weight as well so that's important um, I think personally observational drawing like life drawing is one of the harder parts because it's you have to take like a while to get good at it. So I would say probably start now if you're looking to apply, like start now. I know you probably can't, there aren't any live ones active right now. Like nobody's actually doing it live right now because of everything happening. But I mean, there's like online websites that you can use, you know, you can draw, practice your anatomy and movement and stuff like that. So I think that'll help a lot as well. Um, so yeah, I would personally maybe even get like um, maybe a family member, a friend to pose for you in like more fitted clothing so you can actually have somebody there. I feel like it's kind of hard for me to draw a, a good drawing based off a picture because a picture you just see like a flat image. It's nice to feel and see a person in 3D space. That way you kind of understand like, Oh, you know, this is the weight. I can see the weight here. I can see this line here. And the, you know, so I find it a little easier. So if you can do that, that would be great. Um, yeah, so movement's important. Proportion. I think proportion is something that comes with a lot of practice because each model is different. So you can't just use like, oh, I know a lot of people use like nine, 10 heads or whatever to do the whole body. Like that's just not something you can do if you're doing a 30 second drawing. So it is, it does come down to a lot of practice because your brain, like after you've drawn it for a while, you can kind of understand, you can just see it in, in person and then bring it back down onto the page and be like, oh, I can see like, oh, maybe this leg's this far down and she's not this wide or her shoulders are this angle and stuff like that. So that does come with a lot of practice. I'll just say that now. So it's not, it, 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 it is a lot of practice, I, I feel personally. Um, line weight um, is important. I wouldn't say it's the most important because I'll show you some of my pieces later. Um, line weight, they worry about it later. So I would just focus on movement proportion first. And so I guess in terms of line weight, what I would say is having um, decently clean lines. So it's not thick lines, it's not messy lines. You, you don't keep redrawing over the same spot again and again. So try to do that. I know it's hard when you first start because that's like kind of just how it is. But once you kind of get used to drawing with a Conte stick or char not charcoal, Conte, Conte stick, then it just feels a lot easier. Um, I guess a tip about line weight is that they taught us was kind of the parts of the body that are closer to you, they're darker. So parts of the body that are farther away from you will be lighter. So just keep that in mind if you're drawing, life drawing. Yeah, and also if the model is kind of using any sort of prop, if they're sitting on a chair, if they're holding um, an object, make sure that you draw through the object just to kind of show that you understand how the form is, you understand how that's all connected into one piece. Because usually um, what I like to think is just, whatever the uh, object or prop that the model is in contact with, it's kind of part of the pose because if um, the, the prop wasn't there, um, then the pose won't exist kind of thing. So draw through the prop, draw the chair, make sure that it all looks like a drawing, make sure that it makes sense. Um, yeah, so that's something that's important as well. Um, 
a line of action. I'll kind of describe it in the next page, but yeah, just drawing through, showing structure is important because it kind of shows the way you think and that you actually understand what it looks like, like the whole thing. So these are some of the examples. So for this first one, you can kind of see like I've broken down the body into kind of like a bean shape. So you can kind of see underneath like, okay, so that's where the ribs are. Like the form doesn't look flat. These are, these two are 30 second drawings. So you can kind of just figure out like, okay, so basically the angle of the shoulder is like this and you can show the form through, you know, this, the, I guess the bean shape and the, and the lines are curved based on the flesh, you know, so it's not just like a straight line for the, um, for the, you know, the round of the arm here, like there's a bit of a curve there and you're kind of showing, um, you know, just quick lines because this is a 30 second drawing. So for the quick drawings, um, essentially it's mostly about movement. So you don't have to draw like their eyes, their nose, their fingers and everything like that. It's essentially just capturing the movement of the pose. So that, so that's essentially what they look for in like the quicker poses. So the one down here, I'm just kind of showing the line of action, just showing like this is the way the body's moving. So that's something that's most prominent in the drawing. You could just put that down quickly. But you're also showing like a little bit of the form, how the body's bending, because you can see overlapping of the shapes. So that's really important as well. It shows that you understand how the structure is underneath. You can understand like the rib cage is bending over like the, the pelvis part and the tilt of the head because you could see the bottom of the jaw. So that's just like simple lines like that can tell a lot. Um, so the one on the most right is a five minute drawing. So you can see how it's more solid. And as I said a little earlier before, um, what happens is when you do a longer drawing, it just tends to get more stiff because that's just the way it is. You kind of like lock into more detail and that's just usually naturally what happens. So yeah, definitely get more of a gestural drawing in first. That way when you develop um, a more solid drawing on top. It'll still look fluid, but you can still get the detail in there. So for the five minute drawing, you can still see the structure underneath really lightly. Um, and then you can kind of see the lines over top that, um, you know, solidify the shape a bit more, show a bit more detail. Um, de definitely get the props in there, get the, you know, get the chair in there and stuff like that. I guess this one, she was just stepping on a block, so we didn't draw a block, but I kind of drew a line where her foot was. So that helps tell a story as well. Um, I know certain landmarks. Um, certain landmarks would be kind of down here in the collarbone area. And there's a line that connects from behind the ear to this line. As you can see in that first drawing, you see the line behind the ear down to the neck area. That's one of the main things that you should look for because you usually see it in a model. So that kind of helps attach the head to the neck quickly. You can see that in that first drawing, there's not really, I didn't draw much of the neck. It's just that line, but it still looks like it's still onto the body. Um, and I think that helps a lot with conveying a more solid drawing as well. Um, another thing would be the shoulder blades. So you see in the fifth drawing, you can see lightly that I put in like the back parts here. Those are usually really obvious as well in a model. I think regardless of their shape or size, like you can always see that. So try to get that in. I would just put it in lightly so it's not like super, super dark. Um, so that's something that helps kind of talk about how the arms are moving, describe the movement as well. The spine is important, 100%. If you're drawing a back view, or any sort of twisting view, the spine is super important because it kind of describes how the body is turning and twisting. It kind of describes how it's in space. So that's something that you should look for as well. Um, the ankles, the ankle bones are important. On the fifth picture, I mean, the last picture, um, the you could see the ankle bone, it describes like the angle of the foot. It describes like, you know, how that connects to the leg. So that those are just a few important landmarks that you guys should think about. Another thing is the line that describes the eye. So that just shows which angle the head is tilting, which is super important because it, get, it just finishes off the drawing. So whether the head is turning this way or up or down, like that line helps describe a lot of information as well. So these are some of the drawings that I submitted for my portfolio last year. You see the top two are a little messier. So like I, you know, I've been, since then but um yeah that's what i submitted it, the first one i think the first two the one on the right top right is 30 seconds um the the top left is like about a minute or so and the other two i think were 10 to 20 minutes or the last one might have been a bit longer than 20 minutes 
So yeah, I just kind of felt like those are the strongest options. You can see like I draw through the shapes, like even with the man sitting on the, oh shoot, the man sitting on the chair. Oh shoot, where'd it go? Sorry. The man sitting on the chair, I've drawn through him. I've drawn the chairs. It shows, it tells a story. It doesn't look like his arm is just floating in the air. It's not, it's not like he's just floating in the air. Um, so yeah, definitely draw through your drawings. You know, describe like, you know, how the form is overlapping and stuff like that. I know for quicker poses, it'll be different because that's not something that you need to worry about too much, getting it perfect and stuff like that. So essentially, just to kind of round it up is like the first, like if you do quick drawings, like I would say 30 to maybe even two minute, three minute drawings, um, focus mostly on the movement of the pose before getting into too much detail because otherwise it gets too stiff and you kind of lose sight of like the actual movement. And then whereas if you go into, I guess, three to five minute poses, three to 10, 20 minute poses, yeah, you have more time, you can work on structure more, you could fix your proportions, you can work on the details, the expression, the hair and stuff like that. So yeah, don't worry about that too much when you're doing the quick drawing poses. Yeah, so that's just something to look out for. Um, a few things I would say that would help me in terms of proportions and stuff like that is kind of like when you see the model posing, like kind of hold up a stick or something to kind of like draw an angle, like an angle between the elbow and the foot, like what angle is that? And then you can kind of get that on the page and that helps a lot with proportion looking at like negative space. So like, oh, what is the space? Like instead of looking at just the legs, look at the space between the legs. Like what is the shape of that space? That helps a lot with drawing as well. Like what is the shape be between her? Like, you know, what's the shape that describes this ear to the shoulder? That helps a lot with proportion and stuff like that. Yeah, so just a few tips on that. So the next one we'll talk about hands, which is still part of the observational drawing part. Um, I treated this a lot like a life drawing, so like a regular, like drawing a person. But instead of drawing a person, I just drew hands. And I found that a lot easier because previously when I was drawing them, like I would just focus so much on like the boxes and the cylinders and making sure that it's all right. But I find like if you quickly kind of get that shape in, you block in the hand. So what I usually do is I kind of treat the, the palm as a box. That helps a lot. You can kind of see it here. You can see the line on the thumb here that describes like the plane change there. So that helps a lot with kind of positioning the palm and then you can kind of quickly gesture the fingers in. You can see on the drawing on the right, there's like a line I drew from this finger to this finger, um, just to kind of get the proportions in, making sure the angle's right, making sure that it looks proper. Um, and also I drew through the, the handle. So, that, that helps a lot because that the whole point of this is to see the hands, right? So yes, there's going to be props, but make sure you just draw through the props if you use props so that they can see that you understand what the shape is like through the object. Um, yeah, so I think like definitely gesture first. You're going to have to do a lot of drawings of these and then you can pick whichever one you want. Um, last year's one was like pushing a button. So you could have done a lot of different options and stuff like that. I'm not sure what they're going to do this year, but... Yeah, I guess I wouldn't worry about it too much. Just practice drawing hands, practice the proportions. Um, generally the hand, it's always gonna be a curve like this. It's never like flat, straight. So if you're thinking about hands and knuckles, it's always curved. It's never like straight across. So that's something to keep in mind when you draw hands as well. Um, and then once you've kind of gotten that the hang of, you know, figuring out the proportions of the hand, then you kind of turn it, move it, you know, look at the different wrinkles and how the fingernails sit in the in the hand like it's not just on top like there's you know there's folds there's wrinkles it it goes inside of the finger so then you can kind of understand a bit more and then work on your structure before you work on the details because you need a solid structure the wrinkles and all that it's like relatively easy to add on so just make sure you have a solid looking hand it doesn't look flat it doesn't look broken um, one thing I would uh, suggest to avoid like a seemingly broken hand is if you're double jointed, like for this finger, it like bends a little weird. So try to avoid a pose like that because even though it looks like that, it looks weird. Like it looks weird in the drawing. They just might think that you, I don't know, didn't know how to draw it properly. Um, originally, I think the hand on the right, I did do something like that and it looked weird. So I kind of just brought it back a little bit. So it looked a little less intense. Um, I think you can see the corrections there. I didn't edit it off or anything like that. Yeah, so 
just keep that in mind. If you have double jointed fingers like this, like I would avoid that because it just looks kind of weird in a drawing. And I think it's kind of hard to hold as well if you hold that position. Um, for me though, I did take pictures. I just took, I was holding like the lamp. I think it was this lamp. Um, I was just holding a lamp and I kind of pretend that it was a button. So um, you just kind of do different poses, try different poses, draw different poses. You never know which one's gonna come up better. So then that way you can just pick and choose which ones you like better. Another thing is when you draw hands, make sure that it looks like it makes sense. So for these two drawings, it looks like, it definitely looks like I'm reaching and pressing the button. I've seen a few where it's kind of like, um, for example, like you see the hand like this and then it goes, it goes in a different direction completely and it doesn't really make sense. So make sure that your two drawings make sense with each other. So if I'm reaching like this, then you can kind of, or like this, you can imagine the next pose would be like that. Keep it simple. So it does, it's not like this and then it's like this or something like that. Just make sure that, um, you know, they're cohesive and it looks like it could be animated. Like if you flip them really quickly, it will make, sh it'll, it'll just look, it'll just make sense when you look at it. So, cause they look through so many of these drawings, like you just wanted to make it easy for them to process it and you make it easy for them to show that you understand what structure and proportion and all that kind of stuff is. Yeah. And I personally think it's a little easier anyway. Like if you make it look cohesive, it'll just be a little easier than having to think of a completely different pose. Another thing is for posing, you don't have to make it overly complicated. Like these poses that I've drawn aren't really that complicated at all. They just kind of show like I understand how to draw a hand and that's all they're looking for. You don't have to do all these crazy twisted things with the fingers or anything like that. Just keep it simple, make it easy to understand and make sure that you show them, you know, how like structure and proportion works as well. For this one, I'm going to talk about character. So character, I think, is something that is super fun. Um, I think a lot of people think it's one of the more fun options. Um, so for character, I would suggest what helps me kind of come up with a character is thinking about a story that I would like, like a background, a little history, the personality that I want. Um, like, then I think about those things. And I'm like, okay, like, so then what kind of character do I want? Like, and I kind of create one based on that. Another thing is if you feel like that's a little hard for you, what I do is also I start out with, I'll start off with shapes and stuff, like basic shapes that I've got down here. You play with shapes, play with proportions, and that helps so much because you never know what might click for you. Um, a lot of times, like you might think this one character design is super great, but you know, play with the proportions, play with you know, their pose and stuff like that. And I think that'll help a lot with you figuring out something that might work even better than you might think. Yeah, so, yeah, so figure out your pose in that, structure it, make sure that it looks proper when you rotate it, once you've figured out what you want. So let's say, yeah, you figure out this is the character that I want, break it down into simple shapes. So I'm talking like, like this character down here, like the circles, um, the cylinders, keep it really, really simple. I would say rotate that, make sure that it works when you rotate it before you go into all the details. Because what happens is when you start drawing all the details every time you rotate it, it's just, it's pretty overwhelming. Um, so yeah, start with this simple shape, rotate that like based on what they want you to rotate it like, and then you can get the detail on, you can fix whatever you need to fix. Um, you can see in the picture in the top left here, like there's a bunch of lines going across because um, I'm just trying to make sure everything's aligned, everything makes sense as it's turning around. Um, yeah, so that's just something that I did um, to help with kind of keeping the volume, keeping the shape, keeping the pose. And another thing that I did was that I actually like created a little bit of a sculpture just out of like aluminum foil, a paper clip and a pin and some tape to help pose. Because for this particular character, I think I kind of challenged myself a bit. It was a bit of a complicated pose because as you can see, he didn't start off like four. He starts off almost like a three quarter, but his head's turned and stuff like that. So what I found helped a lot was when I used like a little, um, character that I created, the sculpture I created, to kind of turn and like I'm like, okay, so it looks like this from this angle, it looks like this from this angle. So that helps a lot as well. Um, another thing I found helpful was I actually got my friend to pose for me. Like I got her to pose, like take the pose and I would take pictures, you know, turning in the direction and I would use that as reference as well. It's not always, um, it, it does, it's not always the best because like the proportions are completely different, but it helps to kind of understand like the feet and stuff like that. Um, I didn't add it here, 
but what helps with the feet is if you kind of draw like a grid, like just like a square for the feet. Um, and then you draw like two lines across, one down, one across, um, and you rotate it. It helps a lot because you can kind of see how the position of the feet turn as you go. So that helps with the feet as well. But I'm, you don't have to make it this complicated. I think you just keep it simple, keep it easy to understand, keep the structure in there. And that way it'll just be easier for yourself as well to turn it. I don't think you even have to do this like with drawn by hand. You could just do it digitally. I know a lot of people do that. I just did it, I, draw, I drew it by hand because that's just what I was used to. So it might be even easier when, if you do it digitally as well. Um, yeah, so this is kind of what I did. I just kept it kind of simple. But I, I think like what helps actually really does help a lot is this shape. So just play around with your proportions and stuff like that. And make sure when you do rotate your character, it makes sense. Like the, you keep the volume. So for example, if the body is this wide in this front picture, it's as wide going around, you know, it makes sense. It tells a story. Um, also what I did choose to do, like I don't, you don't really have to do this. What I did choose to do though is I, um, kind of made my character cohesive with my perspective line drawings just because I was just I thought it would be fun you don't have to do that for me though it just helped tell a story kind of helped me kind of imagine a bit more of what I wanted um, I'll show you that later as well so for the animation portion so when I did it they just told us to um, they just told us to do any object and I know a lot of people did really complicated stuff, but I just kept it really simple because I was like, you know what, like, they just need to understand that I know how to do the, understand the volume, understand movement, understand how to actually animate and make it look fluid. Um, I'll show you guys the drawing if you can click it. So it's like super, super simple. It's just like a ball bouncing down a steps. Um, but yeah, like it just makes sense. It's easy to understand. It shows that I understand volume and how it, the movement is, like kind of where the ball is weighted, how it falls and stuff like that down the steps. So that's something that is important as well. Essentially, a lot of this is just, oh, they just want to see how you understand it. It doesn't have to be this beautiful, extravagant um, thing that you submit. They just want to know that you understand, um, you know, what they're looking for. Um, also, you doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be 2D, it doesn't have to be, I know it doesn't have to be like, yeah, it doesn't have to be 2D. Like a lot of people I know submitted like stop motion. I know that's like not kind of, I guess, normal. Like that's really hard to do. But some people submit it like a 3D. They did a 3D animated, I think last year was a juice box or this year was a juice box. Um, so yeah. People did a lot of different stuff, but I would just say stick to what you're comfortable with. It doesn't have to be so crazy. It doesn't have to be like, oh, you don't have to be like, oh, I have to make sure they remember me. You just have to show that you understand like how to animate and how to make it look like an understandable, um, I guess, image, like several like images that they understand. So I kind of talk about my process. So essentially, when you start animating, it's like pretty overwhelming. You're like, oh my gosh, how do I do this? But if you kind of break it down, like I did here, with the line, I kind of just drew how I wanted to ball, how, how I wanted the ball to kind of drop down the stairs. Um, and that's kind of how I drew based on that. So you see the ball, I kind of drew through the structure. Um, I just put in the points, the most important points. So the highest points and the lowest points of the animation. So I drew in where it starts off. And then I kind of go like, okay, so the next highest point is going to be about this high, and this is where it's going to land. So you kind of just draw your ball based on that. Um, I guess it's, if you guys have an iPad, like if you have Procreate, this is, I did it on Procreate, so you can do that as well. You can play around with animating. And there's lots of great tutorials out there as well. So you can just, you know, draw the ball um, in the highest point. So I did that here, and then the lowest point, and I kind of put in the main, um, action points i guess like the main areas that i want it to be in the most important parts and then you can work on drawing like the frames in between so then i added these frames in between so like okay so from the from the first point to the highest point there's going to be a another ball there because i kind of i'm just going to fill in the frames so it looks like it's a it's smooth it's not like choppy 
And so one thing for animation to keep in mind is when a character or whatever you're animating is moving slower, it's going to be more frames. So when there's less frames, it'll be faster. So in the top here, I think I show it here. You can see um, the top of the, at the very peak of the curve, it's, there's a few more balls and they're more closer together because it kind of hangs in the air a little bit before it falls. You see when it falls, there's like, the, the drawings are more spread out and there's less drawings because it's faster. So that's something to keep in mind as well, just to make sure that it's, that there is like um, weight and there is movement and it's not just like, okay, like it's like moving perfectly as well. Um, I think one thing I could have done at the end is just added a few more drawings. I didn't though, but I, I could have, so it would have like showed that it was losing momentum as it was falling. So that's something you guys can keep in mind as well. Um, so just to make sure I would say one thing though is to avoid straight ahead animation and what that is is when you just draw for example the first ball and you just draw the next ball and the next 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 the problem with that is is sometimes you do use it but i would say in terms of i guess in this example i didn't use it because it's hard to maintain the volume sometimes you know you just draw the ball a little bit bigger and then the next frame you draw a little bit bigger and before you know it it's just it doesn't it's a completely different size from when you started out so the animation just does not look fluid doesn't look um it just looks choppy it doesn't look right it's just like warping so i think one thing that helps is the keyframe animation which was which is this kind of animation where you just put in all the main important points that you want in your animation and then you draw in between you put in more frames in between to match those drawings so that way you never really you know, get too off model you never get you never lose too much volume because you always have something to refer to whether it's the drawing before or the drawing after so yeah and then you know another tip is just to keep playing it over and over make sure that it works um yeah so that's kind of what i did um for this animation process i think this one is relatively easier the ball bouncing I don't know what they're gonna give you guys this year. I know last year was a juice box, so. I would just say keep it simple, keep it the structure, make sure that it makes sense. Don't try to do things that are overly crazy because it becomes overwhelming. And a lot of times, like if this is your first time animating, it's hard to actually do it. So yeah, just keep it simple. Keep it simple for yourself, just make it readable. And as long as they see that you can understand the structure and you understand how to maintain the volume throughout it and you can tell some kind of a story then i think that's perfect so for storyboard um i think this is one of the harder um i suppose like categories of the portfolio because i think that's just it's just been that way um but i will give you a few tips that i've learned in school um so just keep your, your drawings as simple as possible if the prop not need to because it will just clutter the screen or it'll clutter for no reason um and that, that's just not what they're looking for make sure that you have a story that you know is simple enough to understand without them having to read the words underneath because essentially um as i've heard like they just look at the pictures first before they read the the words underneath because in, the story needs to be able to tell itself without having to having you needing to describe it because that's what the audience is going to see right like the audience is just going to see the drawings that you put out they're not going to see all the descriptions underneath so that's what they're looking for as well um i would say uh, avoid like bloody stuff violent stuff guns gore because i've seen a few of those and it's just like it's kind of hard to make appealing for me at least i don't think that's something that they're looking for so make it fun make it simple make sure that it's easy to understand i wouldn't i mean yeah you can do a bit of a plot twist that's always really fun um i think that's something most people usually do um but yeah i think just keep your drawing simple easy to understand um, not too much detail and stuff like that uh, make sure that for each drawing you have a focal point that um that you know what like you know what the um reader wants to look at that you know what they want to look at and you kind of draw based on that like in the first picture you kind of want to show like okay so the clown is looking at something so how do i make the audience know that that's what i want them to know and you know so i put the frame behind his head because that helps it kind of kind of makes the eye look right because his head's in the frame 
it's kind of where you want to look. His eye direction is really, really important. So a lot of times we tell story a lot on eye direction, right? So like, oh, he's looking over there. What's he looking at? And then you can kind of see like, oh, okay. So the door is kind of opened. It's pointing towards this thing in there. And then you can kind of tell the story with that. Um, and you can, for the second panel, it's almost like something in the foreground, right? Like, oh, he doesn't see it because he's looking elsewhere, but you can still look at him because he's framed in the doorway. So that's something that I wanted the, I guess, like the, whoever was reading this to understand was, oh, I wanted them to look at the clown and, oh, there's like a bar of soap down there. So like, what's going to happen? Does he see it? It doesn't seem like he sees it because he's looking at whatever the figure is. And the next term is him falling, you know? creating kind of a mom momentum with the soap, kind of showing that, okay, so he slipped on the soap. Um, how did he slip on the soap? And how are the bubbles kind of making the eyes follow where I want them to look? The curve of the pole is kind of creating your attack, uh, attraction. One thing I would say in terms of lines and stuff like that, like if there's more lines in a place, like um, you see where his hand's grabbing the curtain, it's kind of where you will look. Um, so, like that's kind of a tension point in the drawing. You're like, oh, you're looking at his hand, you know that he's falling and it's like, oh, what, what's going on? And so the next picture, I kind of use the pole again to kind of point towards the clown and then kind of to help bring like it all together. I put the clown in the foreground, you can't see how embarrassed he is. And then not only that, you see what's actually behind the curtain was not what he expected. Um, so yeah, I could have kept it a little bit more simple, but maybe that's, I guess that's where I might've lost the marks, but essentially that's what you kind of look for. Look for um, kind of like a focal point, make sure you're telling your story clearly, make sure your story's easy to understand enough without too many plot twists. Cause a lot of times what happens is like you have this really interesting story in your mind and it's, it's not easy to um, kind of convey that. And four panels, four panels is like not a lot of panels. So make sure it's easy to understand. Um, and I would say like, make sure that your line work makes sense like you can read your drawings without shading it because i know a lot of people shade it i don't think it's too much of a problem but personally i think if you want a story that's kind of has a stronger impact i guess is to make sure that it can tell the story without all the tones and stuff like that um so yeah so that's something that i think about when i do storyboarding um what i did though for i would suggest is to draw it on the bigger piece of paper because that way you can, you don't have to worry about drawing so small. Drawing small is kind of harder than drawing big. Um, you can scale it down when you scan it. It's not really a problem. So what I did was just to make the perspective right, I actually drew it out properly. or drew it out in perspective um, so that it all made sense and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so that's kind of how I drew, I drew all four panels big. I did so many redrawings, you know, thumbnailing, making sure that, um, it all looks properly, looks good. Uh, and to thumbnail is important. Um, if you thumbnail, which is like drawing like small versions of the drawing, um, that way you can kind of play around with different compositions. Like, oh, how do I make this better? How do I not make this better? Um, so that's also really helpful as well. Yeah, so yeah, definitely just try to keep it as simple as possible. Only keep what you need to keep in the story. Like if, I guess that towel that I put there doesn't even have to be there because it doesn't really affect the story. So yeah, just keep what you need to keep in the story to help, you know, make it simple and easy to understand. So these are my perspective line drawings. Um, what I did, this was like kind of a long process, but I, I actually really enjoyed doing this because it was like, it made sense with my character. I thought it was really fun. Um, I just enjoyed it. But one thing I would say is to keep story in mind so what kind of ambiance are you trying to set what kind of setting is it you know for me this was kind of like an old western sheriff's office so you know i did reference pictures of that i looked at well what kind of lamps they have back then what kind of telephones you know did he smoke uh did he like guns and hunting and stuff like that so i kind of included those things because i helped it tell the story of like the kind of character that i wanted to create in my mind um for me what i kind of did was I kind of, you can see the chair there and you can see a little pathway to where the cat is on the window. Just kind of like to show, like help the person looking at it kind of walk through the environment, I suppose. Um, kind of help them understand, oh, like what kind of character is this? Like what kind of story does he tell? What does he do? And you, I feel like you can kind of tell just on that drawing without me talking too much about it. 
he's kind of sheriff's office, an olden sheriff's office. And then for the outside, what I did was um, I kind of did the outside of the office. So I kind of described like, oh, so it's kind of like in the middle of nowhere. It's in the mountains. Because I think for my one, they required like, they wanted like landscape or some sort of mountains. So I included that as well with the clouds and um, kind of described like, I kind of look for reference pictures like, okay, so I want this to be around this time period. So what did they do then? Um, what did it look like? So you kind of do a lot of research based on that. I think I guess that's more applicable to if you're doing something like me where it's kind of like back in the day and it actually should make sense. Whereas I guess if you do something based in the future or something more magical, it shouldn't matter too much, but it always helps to look for references as well. Especially for the cactus, you see, I had to look for reference. I'm like, what does a cactus even look like? Kind of getting the textures in there. I think texture is super, super important when you're drawing this, getting the textures right, because I think it's it helps a lot with telling the story. It helps a lot with um, understanding like what the environment is like. Because if you get the texture right, you get the, you know, you can understand that the chair over here in the first picture looks like wood. And why does it look like wood? Well, you know, it looks like wood because of the chips, because of the lines. Like, so it helps a lot if you study or look at pictures or draw pictures of certain materials. Like, okay, so what does a tree look like? Because a lot of times you'll see trees and it just looks like it looks too much. Or it looks too, like, windy. It looks too not doesn't look very natural so kind of study pictures like what do trees look like how does the texture make it look like trees you know what the leaves look like and stuff like that um so that's also really important that i find another thing is if you see in the first picture you see like the floorboards and the paneling on the walls um like you can tell that it's there you understand that it's there you see that okay so it's like a wood floorboard or whatever like you understand that and then you can kind of like think like oh well you know why does it look like that because you know you just kind of imagine it's wood but another thing is um if you guys do a kitchen area i don't know what they're going to give you guys this year but if you do some sort of kitchen area you imagine like the floor tiles so like how does like how do you not clutter up the picture because a lot of times if you have a lot of repetitive lines it just gets it looks really messy so what i did for this first picture was i didn't draw every single line. Like I only drew the ones that needed to be there. So the ones that were attached to the walls or I just wanted to cover up some space with some lines there. And you can kind of see that it doesn't clutter up too much, but you can still see the drawing. So that's, so that's something you should think about as well. Um, when you draw like textures in the floors or in the home or whatever, just keep it simple. Uh, make sure the lines um, kind of don't clutter up the drawing too much. Make sure you just maintain your focal point, which for me, I suppose, was this desk. Um, yeah, so that's something you can do as well. Um, yeah, in terms of, I guess, yeah, definitely look for references for the horses I used a reference, for the ground, the grass, the wheels you know, kind of what the time period, what it looked like. That's important as well. Um, here's some of my process. So this is for the interior. So the first one you can see, it looks completely different from what I ended up with because I just had something in my mind and I kind of changed it. So in the first one, I was imagining more of a modern day, um, modern day sheriff's office. And then I decided that I, I didn't really like that as much. And I kind of wanted it to make, to be cohesive with my character drawing. So that's kind of what I did as well. Um, so I changed it, I changed it completely. So as I mentioned earlier in this presentation, um, to kind of, um, sorry, my dog's like on me. Um, okay, to kind of just figure out the story that you want to tell, right? So the first one, I didn't, I didn't like the way it was going. The second one, I kind of did, um, I guess around the 1950s or whatever, you can kind of tell by the telephone and the clock there that it's a little bit more modern, but I still wanted to push it back a little more make it a little bit more interesting, a little different. So you can see here in the third drawing down there, the bottom left drawing, um, it's different. I developed the second drawing a bit more. I changed the drawer, I changed the phone, I changed the placement. You can see the perspective of the desk and the top right drawing is completely different from what I ended up with just because I just didn't like the way that it looked. Um, it just didn't feel right to me. So for the next one, I just made it bigger. I changed the perspective, I changed the chair, I added different details. So feel free to redraw, 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 redraw. Like you never know what's gonna work better, play with, like, you know, if there's something in the drawing that you're like, oh, I don't like it, just change it. Like just change it because that way, like, you know, when you submit it, you just feel good about yourself and you know that you did your best. Um, 
yeah, so I changed it. And then ultimately I changed it completely again. Cause if you see it in the bottom, right, it's just completely different. I just pushed it way back more, I guess, like in the early 1900s. I don't know. Um, I just want it to be like really like old Western. So I just pushed it really far back. I changed the chair. I changed the layout of the office, you know, I switched it. Um, and so that's something you can always do as well. Like, don't think that, oh, I spent so much time on this drawing. Uh, I just, you know, it might not be perfect, but I spent so much time and I'll just submit it. Like, I don't know. I just don't think you should do that. If this is something that you really, really want to do. Like if, it, if you don't feel right about it, just change it. Like if you have time, of course, and you have the, um, you know, if you have time to change it. Um, I think it helps a lot. It makes you feel, I, for, for me, I felt like, okay, yeah, I felt better about it, you know, when I changed it. Um, Another thing is, I would say, so if you guys have drawn perspective before, um, I'm not sure how many of you have, but you know how, like, it's hard to describe. Okay, but you see in the bottom right picture, like you see like the two flaps of paper on the sides. I guess if you do this digitally, you don't have to worry about that. But, um, you know, play, make sure that the perspective uh, line, the dots, per, the, the dots are off of the, of the page because I know um, a lot of times like some people like they just kind of start off um, I would avoid putting the vanishing points uh, too close to the page because it looks warped it will look distorted um, like if you see I guess in the first picture then I mean no the top right picture the desk looks a little warped looks small looks kind of like weird to me at least um, I think it's because I put the vanishing point too close to the page so at the end so when it kind of tapers off too close to the to the vanishing point it just looks a little weird so i just suggest that you put your vanishing points really far off the page um, um i find it helped because i draw and procreate right but then it, it's a little different like when you adjust it it's kind of annoying so for me i just did this on um i did this on like i literally just physically taped pieces of paper onto the actual drawing so that i could change it whenever i want i'm like oh that doesn't really work or whatever then i could just change that up um for me that was just a little a little easier um and that way i can have a record of all my like process work and stuff like that yeah so i would say one thing though is also to still keep structure keep the structure in your drawings like you see all these lines in that like how did you construct the table how did you construct this lamp how did you construct the i don't know the globe or whatever like you just keep that structure in there so they understand um it doesn't have to be like perfectly finished um, but you can just make sure you show the structure, show that you understand, show your process behind all the drawing and stuff like that, and it should, it should work well. Another tip that I would say is for parts of the drawings that are closer to you, I guess, as I mentioned in the life drawing part, the parts that are closer to you in the drawing, make them a little darker. Um, here, so you can see like the chair and the table, I darkened with the thicker, slightly thicker line because I wanted to show that okay so the parts that are closer just darken the lines a bit more and then the bottom right drawing you can see the cactus which I darken more compared to the clouds in the back or like certain um parts of the drawing in the back yeah so keep that in mind as well so line matters because it shows the depth in the drawing it shows that you understand you know what you want to bring forward what you don't want to bring forward so that's important as well yeah, so this is my process for the outdoor drawing. Um, the first one I did was completely different. I didn't, I don't think I really knew what I wanted to do, but that was one of the first ideas I had in my mind. I wanted to do like a landscape, kind of like a big mansion, but I kind of changed my mind because I, as I said before, like I just wanted it to make sense with my character and the previous drawing. So I changed it up a bit. Um, Okay, so for the top right drawing, um, it's pretty similar to what I ended up submitting. I played around with um, kind of more textures, I added a few more elements like the tree in the back. But one, most of them, one of the most obvious things I would say, I guess not so obvious, but you see the mountains in the back on the top right, it kind of spikes right above the, above the, um, the sheriff's office. Um, but I decided to change that in the next one, if you can see the third drawing, um, where it kind of goes down like around the sheriff's office. And the reason I changed that was because it helped frame it a bit more. So it helped, I guess, like keep the focal point on the sheriff's office, because if you can compare it to the top right drawing again, it, there's kind of a difference between 
kind of having the mountains right above the sheriff's office versus, you know, kind of framing it a bit more. So think about that too. Think about composition. Think about how objects and props in your drawing will affect, you know, the story you're drawing. Um, think about how, you know, that might help the focal point. Um, another thing I did try to think about with the focal point was kind of having the road lead into where the office was. So that helps the eye, the person who's looking at the drawing kind of follow it. Oh, it's like, okay, so this is the main focus. And then they can like look other elsewhere for details and stuff like that. So for the personal pieces, um, this is what I did. Um, I would say just show, show a lot of, I guess, as much as you can with like a variation of medium. So, you know, if you paint, if you sculpt, if you do digital work or like different types of digital work, if you use color pencils, you know, I would say include like a um, variety of them. That way they can kind of see like, okay, this person knows how to paint, this person knows how to scope, this person can color, they understand color theory and stuff like that. So that, that'll help a lot in terms of them kind of seeing you as like more of a well-rounded artist as well. Um, one thing I would say is to avoid like too much fan art or anime. They don't really like anime. Um, so kind of avoid anime. They, yeah, even for your character design. So try to avoid anime stuff because the reason is, I think the reason is because it's just, it's, it's different, the proportions and stuff like that. I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but that's just something that said. They just don't, like anime too much um i guess it's different once you get into school but in terms of your, your portfolio just try to avoid it um just show that you understand like oh you know understand sculpting like what do you understand sculpting and spatial and stuff like that and color when you paint um you know different character designs um, i know they say yeah like try to avoid including too much life drawing um, I know a lot of people, what they do is they just have like one page and it's completely stuffed with um, stuffed with like just like one, like several drawings and they count it as one piece. So I try to avoid that. Just try to submit like as much like the best kind of drawings or paintings or whatever that you have and keep it as like one kind of keep it nice looking, keep it simple, make sure it's not too cluttered, make sure it's easily readable because just keep in mind they are going through like several hundred portfolios. So, you know, the easier it is to read, the easier it is for them to be like, okay, so, you know, I understand that this person can draw well, I understand they can do this, they can do that. So that's, that's important as well. Yeah. So I kind of here included like character design and included more studies. So like realistic human studies, I included, um, some sculptures that I did and then the bottom three are kind of like paintings that I've done. Um, so painting is it'll be important first year. Um, I think clay making maybe later on if we do like more when we do more like I guess um, stop motion kind of stuff but yeah just showing that you understand how to work digitally work analog work you know with your hands and stuff so that's important as well. So I'm gonna talk about life at Sheridan, like what do you do? Like what, you know, what is it like? Um, I would say it's generally really nice. Everyone there is really, really um, supportive. A lot of people there that you go to class with are, you know, they're very motivated because, you know, it's not easy to get in. So a lot of people that do get in, you know, they're very excited to be there. So it's really nice. Um, I think in terms of classes, um, is definitely organize your time because I think first year is pretty manageable. It's not for me. It wasn't like, oh my gosh, it's so crazy. But, you know, it's good to organize your time if you have to work outside of school or if you just want like a little bit of personal time, which is important to do that as well. Um, I think another thing is to make sure that you show up on time because a lot of people don't, which I don't get, but like show up on time, attend your classes, make sure that you're in contact with your professors if you have any questions um, because you know, it's important to just keep in check and make sure that you're there on time and learn what they have to teach you. Um, another thing is to build connections um, because it's important because like this in animation field, it's a little smaller. So like, I think the people that you meet in school or, you know, while you're in school is important because you can kind of, you know, you never know in the future if they have a job opportunity for you or something like that, that way, you know, and kind of you can get a foot in the door a lot easier. Um, another thing is to, even though you're in school, like sometimes it's a little hard to kind of make time to draw more on top of all the drawing, is to always 
just keep practicing. Um, Sheridan offers like, they offer like free life drawing, free life drawing um, every day of the week. So yeah, like go if you can, practice more, practice if you can, that's always helpful. Like even if, you know, especially if you're not super great at it, just practice because that's the only way you're gonna get better. Like, and it's gonna be important because you're gonna do like all, like life drawing in that, like throughout third year, second year, third year, maybe fourth year, if that's something that you choose to do. Um, yeah, and to always ask for help because um, that's so important. Like a lot of times you might feel like, oh, you know, I can just figure it out myself, but you know, like it's helpful to like maybe ask some older people, like older years um, to help you like, oh, how did you deal with this problem? Like, how did you, you know, what is your experience with this year? Stuff like that. Then, then you can get a lot of help from that as well. Yeah. So that's kind of my feeling at Sheridan. Like the teachers are, the professors are super helpful. Um, they're really understanding and stuff like that. So yeah, just make sure that you show up on time in class. Um, make sure that you kind of, if you have any questions in terms of the work, which I personally find kind of straightforward anyway. So it's not so difficult or anything. Just, you know, if you do have questions, ask questions because they're they're usually really patient with that. So it's like, it's not scary or anything like that. Yeah. So in terms of the animation industry, like what is it like after school like you know what is it like um when you kind of graduate school and stuff like that um I would say that it's it's pretty good because what happens is in third year I'm not sure if you guys know already in third year you get like a co-op so co-op is um you just kind of go out put out your portfolio, see who wants to hire you. Um, and that's something that you do in third year. Um, what else do you do? You do so that, yeah, so essentially you get to practice a lot of the portfolio, um, making your portfolio, catering it towards specific companies that you wanna work at. For example, um, if you want to be a character designer or you wanna be, I don't know, a background painter, then you would kind of cater your portfolio towards those people that are looking to do that. And on top of that, um, once you kind of do co-op, once you get that job, I know they also offer jobs abroad. So, you know, like, I don't know, somewhere in Europe or I don't know where else, the States and stuff like that. I know they have co-op with Disney. Like Disney is actually affiliated with Sheridan. So I know they hold spots for Sheridan students that graduate or co-op and stuff like that. There's a few, quite a few students that work at Disney now. Um, I mean, there's a lot of other great like animation places to work at. So, yeah. So it helps get you foot, get your foot in the door, you know, make connections at work, do that. I think that's really important work on like people skills and stuff like that. Um, another thing is, to, yeah, as I mentioned, to prepare your portfolio based on the position you want. So I guess like this portfolio will not ever be the last portfolio you make. Like I just have to keep making portfolios because that's just the way the industry works. Um, you just have to, you know, put your best work forward and cater it to the people that you want to cater it to. And that way you can get the jobs that you want. And to make sure you research the companies because like, you know, you know, Disney might sound great to you, but you know, make sure that you understand like, oh, this is how they work. This is the work ethic. This is how they act like in, you know, during work. I know it's going to be different though for everybody. Like you can't say that like the same experience could be different for two different people. So, so that's just something to keep in mind, um, you know, based on the type of animation they do, they might do more 3D animation, they might do 2D animation. So kind of like, do your research based on that, um, kind of understand, you know, what they're looking for, understand what you're looking for. I know when you first start out, though, you're not going to get too many opportunities, because that's just the way it is, like, and not, not in terms of opportunities, I mean, like, you're not going to be like the head of animation. So you're going to start off kind of like lower, but like the animation industry is kind of like a ladder. So, you know, you work your way up and that's why the um, connections are important because you never know what studio is doing what you never know how they're doing. Um, you know, if they have a position open and you might know somebody that works there that can put in a good word for you. So that's important as well. Um, let's, I guess I'll talk a little bit more about like what first year, second year, and third year, fourth year is like, um, based on what they kind of described to us. So first year essentially is first and second year, you're going to be working mostly on your basic skills. So your fundamental skills, your drawing, your animation, um, you know, making sure that you understand those things better before you kind of proceed on to third and fourth year. So what we do mostly we do a lot of life drawing, we do animate, we do a lot of animating, we do character design, 
Um, basically, everything that you do in your portfolio, you're going to be doing, which is why it's important that you understand what you're doing for your portfolio, that you don't, you know, copy somebody or you just, I don't know, like you make sure you understand what you're doing so that you can um, do it well when school starts because you're going to have to do it for the rest of your career. Um, yeah, so just making sure that you can follow up, keep up. So yeah, we do a lot of those. Second year, we do more 3D stuff. Um, there's more of 3D elements. So you learn how to use Maya. You learn how to animate in 3D. You learn how to rig characters and stuff like that. Um, you do also, I think you do a lot of animating as well. I mean, you, you'll be doing a lot of animating throughout the four years. Um, so third year, what it's gonna be like, it's gonna be a little bit more open-ended so you can choose. Um, third year, you're going to be doing a group film. So you're going to be doing a film with, I don't know how many other people, like maybe four to six other people. You're going to be working on a group film together. And uh, that's going to be the school year, I think. And then you're going to be working, um, you know, based, like a lot of the times, like the the people that work in the groups are kind of they specialize in different aspects of animation. So there's like 2D animation, 3D animation. So you can group with people that um, you feel like could be helpful to uh, whatever project you're working on so yeah you'll be doing a group film and then also in third year you'll be doing the co-op program so i think that's going to be over the summer um yeah so the school will help you with that the school will help you with finding a good co-op placement um all of these places are open to students so that's why they have kind of a connection with sheridan um and then also um third year you're going to be you can choose a bit more. I think um, you can choose whether you want to go into more 3D or you want to go more 2D or stop motion. You get that option. Um, you kind of go into whatever you're interested in. Um, so yeah, there. So that's going to be what third year is like. And fourth year is essentially the thesis film, which is where you yourself um, make a film based on whatever topic you want. Um, you make a film. Um, usually it's about three to five minutes. I think maybe longer, maybe like five to six minutes, because um, it, it is a lot of work. Um, you make literally a whole film story, you storyboard it, you create the characters, you do everything. And also what helps with the connections, as I mentioned earlier, is that um, you can get people that um, specialize in like music or um, audio recording, um, people to do voices for you to um, play your characters for you as well. Um, you can hire people to do that for you. Um, for fourth year students as well, like I know quite a few of my friends back in first year, they were helping fourth year students color in their um, movie. So that's something that you'll have to be doing as well as fourth year is to kind of connect with like other people at school to get them to help you out with your film because it's a lot to do for one person. Yeah, so essentially that's what fourth year is like. It's going to be essentially just you working on your film and kind of putting together everything that you've learned um, at Sheridan, which is gonna be, it's a lot of work, but it'll be a lot of fun as well.